following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. The Gnostic tradition is rooted firmly in the most ancient form of knowledge that was presented to humanity throughout the ages, which is a form of knowledge that is unified. That is, Gnosis studies all aspects of life and living. We don't compartmentalize the way modern systems of education tend to do. So in the Gnostic tradition, we study simultaneously the four great pillars of life or knowledge, art, science, religion, and philosophy. These four pillars support the temple of wisdom. They maintain the edifice of the temple and allow us to have a comprehensive understanding of our place in the universe and our place in relationship with God. This comprehensive point of view allows us to have a comprehensive understanding of existence, what it means to be alive. And this is part of the reason why our most recent traditions, such as the tradition that has called itself religion, or the tradition that has called itself science, have remained very limited in their ability to provide us with lasting answers to life's most vexing questions. Those who have dedicated themselves to following one thread to the exclusion of the others have inevitably found themselves lacking in critical areas of their understanding of life. So those who have dedicated themselves to religion and excluded science, excluded art, excluded philosophy from their understanding have thereby restricted themselves from grasping the totality of life and what life means. And likewise, those who have followed the, tre- the thread of, sci- of science and have rejected religion have thereby limited their own understanding. But in Gnosis, we study them all. And it's in this way that we can begin to penetrate the mysteries that are outside of us and inside of us. This understanding is very important. To bear in mind these four aspects of knowledge, because all of us have limitations in our own knowledge. We have come from backgrounds and traditions, countries and cultures, in which certain aspects have not received their full due. We may have some education in science, but none in religion. 
We may have a lot of education in religion, but none in science. We may know a lot about art, but nothing of science, or nothing of philosophy. And this needs to be rectified in order for us to understand what gnosis actually is. And that gnosis is not something in a book. It is not something in a school or in a lecture. Real gnosis is inside of your heart. Real gnosis is something that emerges through self-knowledge, through knowing oneself. This is perhaps the basic postulate of the Gnostic approach, the fundamental idea. All knowledge that exists in the universe also exists within us. And this is why the oracle at Delphi stated, Man, know thyself, and thou shalt know the universe and its gods. Everything and every level of existence in nature is inside of us also, reflected like a mirror. Our body, our physical body, reflects all the laws and structures of the cosmos. Our physical body is a microcosm, a mirror, in other words, that reflects all of the laws that exist outside of us. By studying ourselves, we also are studying nature. And this is how Gnosis is a science. It isn't a belief. As a science, we seek to experiment, to experience, to see for ourselves, to know. And that is really what gnosis means, to know, to have knowledge, not just in the mind, the intellect, not just a belief, not just a habit or some behaviors that we adopt, but to have experienced it, to have seen it, to know it, to verify it. That is Gnosis. That method of verification, of knowing, is something that is also distinct and different from what we may have learned growing up, what we may have learned in school, what we may have learned in church. The Gnostic method of knowing is not a method of knowing through concepts, through ideas, through theories, through beliefs. It is something cognizant, something conscious. As an example, all of us can take a moment and become very aware of our physical bodies. And we can reach with our consciousness and feel the body. And really become seated and present in our body. This is Gnosis. This is to become cognizant, to see it, to verify it, to know it. And in this way you see and know and experience, yes, I see, I taste, I feel, I experience what it is to be in a body, to be in this body. That is Gnosis. But that is only a seed. It is only a very, very small taste of what the consciousness can experience. Because this body is a marvelous machine. A machine that has enormous energies, many kinds of great complexity and great power. Energies that can affect the outside world and the inside world. Energies about which we ignore. We may all agree, 
Yes, I experience thought. And yes, I've experienced what we can call emotion. And yes, I've experienced what I can call sensation. But how many of us can discriminate and correctly identify them when they occur as being what they really are? How many of us can clearly differentiate between a positive emotion and a negative one? How many of us can control thought? Because to see, to merely see the energy, to taste, to feel, to know the energy is there is only one thing. To control it is another. So we can say, yeah, I have a physical body. And yes, I have a certain degree of control over it. But all of us would be forced to agree that that control is very limited. We cannot control pain. We cannot control sickness. We cannot control hunger. We cannot control thirst. We cannot control many of the processes that occur in our body continually. Digestion, breathing, heart rate, metabolism, the flow of blood. the endocrine system. All of these processes that are unfolding constantly in our bodies. And yet, we depend on this machine to be alive, to experience everything that we experience. In some way, it seems a little bit contradictory that we proclaim ourselves to be masters of the universe to be kings and queens over nature, and yet a simple headache can destroy our day. A little slight edge of hunger can ruin our emotional state and make us grumpy and angry. A slight cut on that body, a slight irritation on that body, can make us behave very irrational and lose complete control over our mind. A little discomfort, a little inconvenience can cause us to act like crazy people. None of us can deny that. We all experience it. This is the fundamental basis from which Gnosis begins. This basis reveals to us that we are not what we presume to be. We believe ourselves to be great beings, and yet the evidence proves that we are terribly weak and suffer from a great deal of ignorance about ourselves. That's why we study these teachings, to change that. We're not studying mere theory. We're studying structures, laws, art, science, religion, philosophy, four pillars that give us a fundamental basis from which we can change. We can work on ourselves. We can fundamentally alter our situation. We can all agree on that. Our goal is change. None of us are content with the way things are. Otherwise, we wouldn't come to these kind of studies. All of us have this inquietude, a dissatisfaction, a sense that things can be better. And it's likely that most of us have already tried many techniques. We've tried science, we've tried religion, we've tried art, we've tried philosophy maybe many religions, maybe many sciences, and none prove capable of changing these problems that we have. Not merely our personal problems, but our problems as a society, as a planet, as a culture, as a race, our problems in our families, in our communities. That's because when isolated, these four pillars cannot act 
Science without religion is impotent. Science without religion is destructive. If you want proof, look at how much of our money is spent in science. And on what? The vast majority of our scientific expenditures are on weapons. We like to think that it's on things like global warming, making better food supply, improving health and medicine. No. The vast majority of our money in science is spent on weapons, on violence. This is a statistical fact. And in fact, that percentage has been increasing decade after decade after decade, increasing more and more money for weapons. That's our science. Our great science of this civilization is not cell phones or computers. It is weapons. We don't like to look at that and admit that, but it's a fact. What about religion? Religion without science is also impotent to change our fundamental problems. Religion without science becomes a blind, stupid faith. And I mean stupid in the sense of not having knowledge, of being ignorant, of believing things that are fundamentally untrue. We find this case especially now when science has penetrated some mysteries and has revealed some things and religion steadfastly refuses to accept it. What about art? Art without religion is idiocy. What do we call art now? Expressions of violence. Expressions of lust. Most of the creative activity on this planet nowadays is spent cultivating art forms that celebrate killing, that celebrate animal behaviors, that celebrate sarcasm, that celebrate cruelty. We don't see art on this planet that celebrates the divine, that celebrates the virtues of the spirit. And what about philosophy? It's the same. Philosophy divorced from art and religion and science becomes nihilism or eternalism, becomes these forms of philosophy that are divorced from reality, that encourage emotional and spiritual emptiness, and that divorce man and woman from their fundamental goodness. Therefore, it's necessary for us to study these four pillars in balance, to understand them in balance, and to work with them in ourselves. Science, traditionally, has focused its study on matter and energy. And we see this is true because the great revelations that science has brought us in the last century or more have been related with modifications and manipulations of matter and energy. Everything that we enjoy as a development of science relates to these two phenomena, matter and energy. On the other hand, art, religion, and philosophy traditionally have always been concerned with consciousness, our inner spirit, who we truly are as a person. But unfortunately, in the last centuries, art, philosophy, and science have also abandoned, I mean art, philosophy, and religion, have also abandoned the consciousness and have only been concerned with matter and energy. Totally forgetting qualities of spirit, qualities of mind. The fact is, we have then inherited from these pillars of our knowledge in society a great misunderstanding. We have come to believe that we are the body. And that's it. And our philosophies say there is no life after death. And our science says there is no life after death. And our religions say there is, but it's eternal. And you're either in heaven or hell. 
So you see, all of these traditions, in their isolation from each other, have arrived at conclusions that do not agree with the fundamental laws of nature. What does science say? Science and many of our philosophies and many of our art forms now say, when you die, that's it. They all say, we only have one life to live, right? We might as well live it to the fullest and indulge ourselves in every manner of pleasure we can. And this is the way of life, especially in Western culture. Live fast, die young, right? Whoever has the most toys dies, when he dies, wins. Isn't that the idea? Isn't that the basis of Western culture now? Gather up as much as you can, whether it's material goods or experiences, before you die. Because when you die, when you're dead, it's all over. There's nothing else after that. This is what our society believes. And yet, do you know that this disagrees with the single most fundamental law of science? The most basic fundamental law of physics disagrees with that. And yet, science itself doesn't admit it. It's very odd. The most fundamental law of physics is reflected in the first principle of thermodynamics. This is basic physics. If you have kids, they're learning this in school. That law says everything that happens is based on transformations of energy. Everything. That law also says no matter what happens, the total amount of energy is always the same. But what that law also says is that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Ever. It can only be modified. Energy changes form, but you cannot destroy it. Do you see what I'm pointing at? If energy cannot be destroyed, what about the energy of your mind? What about the energy of your heart? The energy of your soul? It cannot die. This is the fundamental law of physics. All physics depend on this law. Now, this fundamental principle that all physicists, this includes in biology, it includes in all the physical sciences, this fundamental law is also called invariance. It is also called the law of energy conservation. It is also called the law of symmetry. It has many names. The most important aspect of it to grasp is very simple. Energy cannot be destroyed. So why are we afraid of death? Why are we afraid? Because we have ignorance about death. Because we don't know. You see, we have a physical body. This physical body is matter. We can agree on that. All of us can touch and feel and sense the matter of the physical body. We can also agree that we have energy. A certain amount. Some days we feel less. Some days we feel more. Some days we really need caffeine. Some days we really need a nap. Some days we feel very energized. Sometimes we feel very energized mentally. 
sometimes we feel very drained and weak mentally. So there are different kinds of energy. But fundamentally, we can agree, yes, we have a physical body. It is matter. And there's energy there, too. But let's go deeper than that. What is matter? What is it? We've all heard all kinds of theories and concepts. We know the body has organs, many different components. We've heard about molecules and cells. We've heard about different kinds of amino acids and proteins and carbohydrates and all this stuff that we're supposed to eat and not eat. We've heard about atoms. But what is matter? Fundamentally. Well, physicists are still trying to figure that out, to be honest. But in Gnosis, we have the answer. It's quite simple. Matter is condensed energy. That's all it is. Condensed energy. Now, it's simple to state that, but to understand it, to comprehend it, is something else. What is that condensed energy? Well, if we were to use Sanskrit terms, we would use the word karma. Karma simply means cause and effect. Some say destiny, but that's not really accurate. What is your body? It is the condensed energy from former actions. And the most superficial level, it is the condensed energy of one moment when your parents experienced the sexual union. In that instant, the energy and matter of your father and the energy and matter of your mother united. That was a profound act with enormous consequences. Those consequences are your 20, 30, 40, or 50, or 60 years of life. But that single act simply act as a valve, a doorway. Everything that you are did not emerge out of nothing. Everything that you are did not simply come out of an egg and a sperm. They were simply vehicles. Just the same way your body is just a vehicle. It is condensed energy. But what is that energy? Where does it come from? In that moment of conception, when the egg and sperm meet, they unite, they merge, they become one. They open a door, a channel, into which your consciousness is placed. This is what science is missing. This is why science needs religion, philosophy, and art. And this is because every cosmic form has matter, has energy, but is consciousness. This is very different from what most people think about science or even religion nowadays. Most people nowadays, when they think about science, when they think about the scientific concepts they know, they're a couple hundred years behind our current scientists. And they're a couple thousand years behind Gnosis, the real teaching, the real knowledge, including myself. Thousands of years behind the knowledge that's available, the knowledge that's there if we know how to get it. So let's back up and look at this again. We have a body. We know that body is matter. We know that body can only be active and used if it has energy. This is self-evident. If you take the energy out of a body, the body dies. On the other hand, we've seen bodies that have energy that are dead. I know some. I know people like that. Bodies that walk around that have energy, but spiritually, they are dead. They have no conscience. 
They are dead. Meaning, they will kill, they will steal, they will lie, they will hurt, and they will enjoy it. And they don't care. These are the living dead. We all know people like this. We've seen them. What's happened in that type of person is that the consciousness that should be enlivening that vessel has become completely absorbed, completely trapped in harmful states of being. Every cosmic form from the very smallest existing element all the way up to the entire universe has three aspects. Matter, energy, consciousness. Matter is always modified or conditioned by where it is. Look at our bodies. Our bodies are the way they are because of where we are. Our bodies exist in a state of relativity. That's a very deep topic in and of itself, to understand that. Furthermore, the energies in our body are conditioned by that body. If you lose a limb, if you lose an organ, if you have a sickness, if you have an illness, your energy is conditioned. It changes. If you become weakened, wounded, your energy changes. It becomes conditioned. If you have a sickness, if you're not healthy, if you don't eat right, if you eat garbage, your energy becomes conditioned. If your mind is filled with garbage, if your heart is filled with garbage, your energy becomes conditioned, limited. This is obvious. Furthermore, consciousness is conditioned by where it is, its relative state. This is the most profound aspect of the three. But to understand that, we need to know what consciousness is. Matter and energy, we all have some vague ideas about what they are. Consciousness, maybe not. How many people here can define consciousness? Definitively. Everybody shrinks, right? Don't call on me. I don't know. <laughs> That's why consciousness is not easy to understand. It's the most subtle of the three, isn't it? Matter, okay, matter. Wood, stone, metal, cells, flesh, the planets. It's all matter, right? Dust. Gases, it's all matter. Energy, okay, energy, we get that. Fire, air, earth, all the things that make the matter move. Energy makes matter active. This is clear. We get that. Consciousness, mm, not sure about that. What is that? If you don't know what consciousness is, then you will never know what religion is. If you don't know what consciousness is, you will never know what spirituality means. Religion and spirituality have a sole purpose to awaken consciousness, to make it alive, to develop it, to perfect it, to bring it to its complete development. And I'll tell you a secret. That's why you're alive. We aren't here on this planet just to indulge ourselves like animals. Burrowing our noses into the filth of the earth. That is not why we're here, to live like pigs and monkeys. We are here to master nature and to transcend it. That is why we have a body. That is why we have a planet. Unfortunately, we don't get it 
So we're destroying the planet, and we're destroying our bodies. That's why we're suffering. We're breaking the fundamental laws, and we suffer as a consequence. It's not complicated. But if we learn about this consciousness, what it is, not outside of us, not as a theory, but right now, what is it? So look into yourself. Matter we've identified. Okay, I have a body. I feel this body. It's here. This is my body. I'm in my body. Energy. Well, I'm awake. I have energy to move. I have energy to think, to move my eyes, to breathe. Consciousness. You can perceive. That is consciousness. The ability to perceive. Right now, all of us are perceiving through physical matter and through energy. But perception itself is not matter, and it is not energy. It is beyond that. But you have to sense it. You have to be aware of it. And not just in a moment, not just right now, continually. This is really what the word mindfulness means. Or watchfulness. The word we use in this tradition is self observation. This is a state of active, watchful perception. To just watch, to be aware. It is not passive. It cannot be put on autopilot. It doesn't come by assumption or automatically. It is not an innate gift. You are not born with it. You have to develop it. Many spiritual groups claim that they are awakened, that they are creatures of light and beauty, and yet they are filled with darkness and ugliness, vengefulness, envy, jealousy, fighting each other, competing with each other, trampling on each other. That is not conscious. That is animal. Consciousness has many levels. Many, many levels. And that's why we study the Tree of Life. The Tree of Life, or the Kabbalah, is a map or a glyph that represents for us levels of consciousness. It also maps all the levels of existence. Everything. From the universe down to the smallest, most minute particle. On every level can be understood on this structure. We here exist in physical bodies with our energy and with some degree of consciousness, even it's very small and very weak. And if we learn about that consciousness inside, we can begin to learn that that consciousness has nearly infinite potential. Yet, that potential is positive and negative. It is possible in oneself to awaken that consciousness and to develop power over matter and energy. To be able to manipulate matter and energy with the consciousness. And to change matter and energy. And all of us must sense that, or at least believe it. And that's why we're studying religion, or spirituality. We sense, we feel, there is a possibility inside to change. To find something better than just this mechanical existence of suffering and pain. But be warned. There is a path, but like any path in life, you can go up that path or you can go down that path. 
The path looks the same, and both directions use matter and energy, harnessed by consciousness. But which way you go depends on what you do. Depends on how you direct your matter and energy. This is what we need to grasp. All of us are directing ourselves through life, using our consciousness to control our matter and energy. Unfortunately, we're not really aware of how we do it. In fact, we're asleep. And this is why all of our religions constantly affirm to us, awaken. Awaken from this dream of life. Being hypnotized by life, by sensations, by pleasures and pains. Awaken and see yourself. You see, with our consciousness in its current state, manipulating matter and energy, we're producing consequences. But we don't realize the consequences. This is the problem. This is why we need to study these laws. This first principle of thermodynamics is extremely important. You cannot understand religion without this law of science. Shall I repeat that? If you've studied religion and you've not studied science, be warned. You need to know this law. At least know this law. This is the most important scientific law. Without question. You can ignore all the rest of science if you want. But memorize this law. The first law of thermodynamics. Everything that happens is because of transformations of energy. Why is this so important? Well, we're studying religion and spirituality. We want to unite with God. We want to achieve yoga or religare and unite with our innermost, with our divine. We want to become a Buddha or an angel, whatever we want to call it. You can, but to do it, you have to transform energy. This is a law of nature. God created nature. God does not break his own laws. Many people talk about awakening the kundalini, awakening chakras, creating bodies, etc., 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 and yet they ignore this law. Here's the second part of it, very important. No matter what happens, the total amount of energy stays the same. Now that might shock some of you. Especially in some spiritual traditions, we're always talking about getting more energy. I need more energy, so I'm going to do more mantras. I'm going to do more vocalizing, because I need more energy. And they'll start drinking certain kinds of drinks, eating certain kinds of food, doing exercises to get energy. Well, you can get help, and you can definitely modify energies with these exercises. But this law of physics states, no matter what happens, the total amount of energy is always the same. On a universal level, in terms of the cosmic day, this means that when the light unfolds from the absolute, when the Ainsoff creates the Ainsoff ore, there is a certain quantity of energy that creates all manifestation. That quantity never changes. Fundamentally, that's what this law means. But secondly, it applies to our microcosm. When the ray of creation descends, when our monad, our ray, unfolds itself, there's a certain quantity of energy there. That quantity doesn't change. The quality changes. That's the difference. The quality. Furthermore, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only change forms. Again, we all talk about, in religions and spirituality, creating energy. This is wrong. 
No one creates energy, only God. And he creates it once, and then it's there for us to do with it as we will. What this means is, when you're born, you have a given quantity of energy. Fixed. Fixed quantity. That's it. That is your energy. That's all you've got. Gurdjieff called this Boban Kaldanots. Vital values. A certain quantity of energy that we are allowed to use. Now, obviously, some of us who are living to our great uh, modern statement of life, live fast and die young, are doing just that. We're burning up all that energy as fast as we can. And we die young. However, if we conserve that energy, if we use it wisely, we can live a long time. Much longer than we think. And in a different way. This relates to a very interesting myth which was told in the Assyrian or Babylonian times thousands of years ago <clears throat> about a goddess named Ishtar. Ishtar is the Assyrian or Babylonian version of Venus or Isis. And like we have in many other mythologies, such as Isis Osiris, or in the story of Persephone or Pandora, of which we've talked recently, Ishtar descends into the underworld because of her love, because of her husband. And when she descends into the underworld, she has to abide by the rules even though she's a goddess. And this story is very deep and has many levels of meaning. But the specific level of meaning that applies to what we're discussing now is that as she enters, well, let me read it to you because this will give you some idea of the importance of this myth. This myth begins in on a certain tablet that was found in, in uh, Babylon. To the land of no return, the land of darkness, Ishtar, the daughter of the moon god, directed her thought. To the house of shadows, the dwelling of Irkala, to the house without exit for him who enters therein, to the road whence there is no turning, to the house without light for him who enters therein, the place where dust is their nourishment, clay their food. Most philosophers and scholars who have studied this transcription have assumed that this underworld is what we would call hell. But it isn't. This world she's descending into is the physical world. The physical body. Who else eats dust all the days of their life but Adam and Eve? who were expelled from Eden to eat dust and to suffer. Adam and Eve, when they entered the physical world. So this myth of Ishtar represents archetypes in our consciousness that descend into the physical body. So this story continues. At her, on, when she arrives at the gate, she demands of the gatekeeper to open the gates. And he says, don't damage the gates. Let me go ask my queen, the queen of the underworld. And so the queen, when she hears that Ishtar has come down, says, what has moved her heart? What has stirred her liver? Does this one wish to dwell with me? To eat clay as food? To drink dust as wine? So these are two aspects of the same thing. We've talked in other lectures about how the goddess has different forms. Pandora has positive and negative aspects. Isis, Kali, Durga. These are two faces of the same goddess. The goddess above, the goddess below. And the goddess below, who manages physical matter, who is Mother Nature, says, why is the celestial goddess coming here? 
And in this great drama, the Divine Mother below says, let her in. And the gatekeeper goes to let her in. And Ishtar has to pass through seven gates. Seven gates. At the first gate, the gatekeeper removes her crown. At the second gate, he removes her earrings. At the third, her necklace. At the fourth, her jewelry. At the fifth, her girdle. At the sixth, her belt. At the seventh, her cloth that was covering her hips. So by the time she passes through the seventh gate, she's completely exposed. And then she sees the queen of the underworld, and they fight. They have a conflict. Now this myth may sound just like a typical myth, but it hides a great truth. It hides involution. In our cosmic development, when our inner star unfolds itself into manifestation, it has to descend and be modified by all the levels of matter and energy through which it descends. The ray of creation descends through the logoic realms, atmic, buddhic, causal, mental, astral, vital, and physical. Seven levels. Seven dimensions. Seven aspects of our psychology. And that spark is stripped because of karma. Because this is the law. So that when that spark arrives as energy to activate a body, it is weak, it is powerless, it is small, it is exposed, and it is in conflict. When Ishtar arrives into that underworld, the queen of the underworld afflicts her with diseases, with sicknesses, with illnesses, with problems. That is us. Our spirit. Afflicted with all the problems of life. Afflicted with the problems of having a, a physical body. Afflicted with karma. This is normal. It's a little abnormal in our case because our karma is so heavy. In other cosmic scenarios, it's not this dramatic. For us, it's very dramatic. Very painful because our karma is so strong. Nonetheless, we need to learn about how to change this situation. The method is to take conscious control of our energy to manage our matter and energy consciously. So we need to learn about the kinds of energy that we have. We need to experience them. We need to taste them. We need to manage them. We talk about seven primary types of energy. This is not a comprehensive list. There are innumerable forms of energy, more than we could ever put into a list. These seven concern our well-being. These are the forms of energy that we need to manage, that we need to modify, that we need to control and master spiritually or in to, have, to have any kind of realization of religion. The most obvious one is mechanical energy, the energy of the physical body or any energy in the physical world. Many religious and spiritual people believe that through mechanical energy, they can reach God. So they listen to certain recordings or tapes, or they play certain kinds of sounds in their house, or they hook themselves up to machines, or they do certain kinds of exercises with their physical body, or they go to certain places, like holy fountains or temples or things like this to get energy in the physical world. Believing that this will reach God it doesn't. There could be a presence of God. There could be other energies active there. But physical energy is not a vehicle to God. 
It's just physical energy. Likewise with vitality, which is related with our ethereal vital body. There are many who believe that through vitality, we reach God. And so they learn exercises like pranayamas, tantra, many types of practices, qigong, reiki, negong, taoism, many types of diverse exercises that harness vital energies. These are all important. They all have functionality according to their level. But that alone cannot awaken your consciousness and take you to God. Even if you did 10 million practices of pranayama this week, you will not reach God with just that. It's impossible. Second, or third, emotional energy. Our emotional energy is very clearly the energies of our heart. Feelings, beliefs, as sincere and beautiful as they may be, our devotion to God, our bhakti, cannot unite us with God alone. No matter how much devotion for God we have, that alone cannot unite you to God. No matter how much emotional love you may have for humanity or love for God, that alone cannot take you through initiation. It cannot develop your soul. It cannot take you to the heights. The fourth, mental energy related with netzach, our mental body. Clearly this is thought, concept, theory, logic, reason. And there are many who follow this path, very studiously memorizing the scriptures very studiously studying the laws and structures and the many complex uh, equations and algorithms that manage the functions of nature. And they can quote scriptures in amazing ways. But the intellect cannot take you to God. It cannot unite you with your inner spirit. Fifth, the energy of will, which is related with Tiferet, with also with our heart. And this is pure willpower. It's will over the body. It's will over energy. It's will over emotion. Will over mind. But even that cannot unite with God on its own. And then we have six and seven, energy of consciousness and energy of spirit. Now we're getting somewhere. Energy of consciousness is related with Gebra, with the divine soul, with Buddhi. This can unite us with God. Seven, the energy of our spirit, that is God. That is the energy of Chesed, or Atman, our inner Buddha, our inner father, our innermost, the monad. Now, all of us, at some point in our life, have experienced mechanical energy, physical energy, or energy in the physical world. We may have experienced vitality. We may have had some feeling, for example, you may have meditated and felt your physical body sitting in one way, but then you felt energetically like you were sitting a different way. Or maybe you felt your arm fell asleep and you felt like your arm was in a different position than your physical arm. Or maybe you felt strong energies in your spine or strong energies in your head or in your heart that don't seem related with what's happening with you physically. These are forms of vital energy. Emotional energy, we've all felt to some degree. Strong love, strong anger, strong lust. Resentment, joy, peace, discomfort, disquiet emotionally, fear, anxiety, mental energy, we've all felt. What about will? 
Not so much. A lot of us would struggle to define what that means. Have I felt that? Do I know how to manage will? Well, you might. It depends. Did you try to go on a diet? Did you try to take up an exercise regimen? Get rid of that belly? How long did you stick with it? Why did you lose it? Will is harder to qualify, isn't it? Because it's beyond emotion. It's beyond thought. And yet emotion and thought can knock it right out. Even mechanical energy can knock it out. We get the idea, yeah, I'm going to go on a diet. Oh, you know what? I'm going to meditate every day now. Starting today. But then two, three days later, back in front of the TV, <clears throat> watching those football games, or watching those soap operas, whatever, willpower is out the window. Easily. Well, if will is so easily knocked out of the way, what about consciousness? We may have heard about self-remembering and self-observation. We may have heard about watchfulness, mindfulness, the necessity to be in the moment. And we think, yeah, that's a beautiful principle. I'm going to live by that. And then we're off somewhere else. Thinking about things, remembering things, worrying about the future, remembering the past. And then we put the cat in the refrigerator and put the milk outside. <laughs> Did you get that? Everybody's sleeping? You put the cat in the refrigerator <laughs> and you put the milk outside. Usually people laugh. The idea is that we fall asleep. We begin to manipulate and move our body without consciousness. If you don't think you do it, start to pay attention because you do. We all do. We set the body to a task and then we send our mind somewhere else. You see, most of us can do our jobs without thinking about it. Most of us can drive the car without thinking about it. We can walk to the store. We can buy the groceries. We can be on the internet. We're doing one thing, we're thinking another. But the shocking thing is, we're often feeling something altogether different. There's a great disparity, a great disequilibrium in what we are doing, what we're thinking, and what we're feeling. And in that entire environment, there is no consciousness. We are asleep, completely unaware of ourselves. This is why we study the human machine. We need to watch our mind, our thoughts. We need to watch our heart, our feelings. We need to watch our body sexually, instinctually, and in our motor skills, motor actions. This is not just every once in a while. It's continual. And this is why we learn to meditate to sharpen that skill, to learn more, to go deeper, to get control of ourselves. You see, we don't have control over ourselves. The problem is that because we've lost control of our human machine, all the energy and consciousness of our being is in this physical body. And what's surging in us all that energy which is conditioned and all that consciousness which is conditioned but conditioned by what we like to think we're awake that we are spiritual people that we are on the upright path but when we observe our minds when we're really sincere with ourselves and we see in our mind is rampant pride an abundance of jealousy, envy, competitiveness, vengefulness, spite, fear, resentment, lust. None of that belongs to God. None of it. 
came from God. All of it came from us using our matter, energy, and consciousness in a harmful way, which produced the consequence of the ego. The ego is represented here as the shadow of the tree of life. And because we have that karmic consequence in our psychology, we are trapped in the wheel of suffering. We call this evolution and devolution. We are cycling in repeated motion, not only from day to day, from week to week, but from life to life. We all bemoan our state in life. Why do I have to suffer like this? Why is my life like this? Why can't it be like so-and-so? The reason is because of your karma. Because of your mind, your actions, your conditioning. When we act asleep continually day after day, we are feeding that cycle. Our consciousness, conditioned in anger, conditioned in pride, conditioned in envy, acts in an envious way, in a proud way, with arrogance, with anger, with resentment, with desire. And the consequence is more suffering. Very simple. Energy changes form. It cannot be destroyed. In the same way that physics states this, you can see it in your life. Look and study the continuity of your experiences in your life. This is why we meditate, to start to pick out the threads of our life and to see that thread just keeps changing form, but it is the same thread. This suffering that I have with my spouse is the same suffering that's repeating again and again and again in my life. The suffering at my job, the suffering with my friends, the suffering at church. It's these threads in our life of karmic flow, karmic energy. Listen, we have a fixed quantity of energy related to our ray. The majority of that energy is trapped in this problem. But here's the beauty of it. When you understand yourself, when you gain mastery over that anger, and you tell that anger, no, anger is not in my house. I'm not welcoming anger in my heart, in my mind, in my body. No more. That is will. But to do it consciously is to comprehend it, to understand it. In that, there is a methodology you can use to harness energy and to pulverize that conditioning and to free the energy inside of it, thereby restoring your rightful inheritance, the energy of your spirit the energy of your mind, the energy of your heart. Energy that is now trapped, but once freed, is awakening. That is liberation. That is awakening. It is to liberate ourselves from ourselves. This is what we call a revolution. In synthesis, all the energy that we should have that, cre that should create enlightening, awakening, liberation, wisdom, all the virtues and beauties that would exist in a master or an angel or a Buddha, that should be in us, is now trapped in our infernal worlds, in our own abyss, in our own hell. But once we start to liberate it piece by piece, we start to illuminate our tree. We start to free Ishtar or Persephone, or Pandora, or uh, Eurydice, or Helen. All of these symbols have the same meaning. The maiden, the virgin, the goddess who is trapped by the dragon, the beast, in the abyss. And the hero has to save her. We know these stories. This is the key. Law of physics. If we want spiritual development, 
The only way to acquire it is through transforming our energy. It isn't from taking anything from outside of us. Let me state that in another way so you can understand this. No master can save you. No guru. No teacher. No school. No movement. No book. They cannot save you. You have to save yourself. Now, when Christ, through Jesus, said, I am the way, he was talking about Christ, which is an energy. He was not talking about a man. He was talking about a force, an energy. And when that energy comes, it transforms us. But let it be understood that that energy can only come when we are properly prepared. That energy actually is the same force, the same vibration as the ray of lightning that produces death. You see, he says, I am the way, I am the life. Life and death are two parts of the same thing. Thus, if we were to receive that ray, that light, as we are now, we'd be obliterated. We need to be prepared for that light. And the preparation is free Ishtar. Eliminate the ego. Harness those forces and energies and begin to create the soul. The soul is a very specific term. It isn't something vague. It isn't something that's open to interpretation. This word refers to a vehicle, a vessel. In other words, a transformer. You see, our physical body is a transformer of energy. It's very obvious. We eat, we drink, we breathe, we take in impressions. We're constantly transforming energy. This is what sustains our life. If we stopped those activities, we would die. But the physical body can only transform a very narrow range of energy. We can't eat stones. We can only eat and drink and breathe a very narrow range of elements from that range of available elements. Likewise, the soul is a transformer of spiritual energy, many kinds of energy. But we don't have it yet. And this is why Jesus said, with patience, ye shall possess thy soul. He never said we had a soul. The soul is the chariot of Ezekiel, the Merkaba. It is the ark of it is the chariot of Apollo, the chariot of Helios. It is the wings of Icarus. It is those marvelous armaments that Aeneas receives from the goddess. It is the golden armor given to the warrior for him to fight the dragon. That is the soul. The soul is a very specific creation Related especially with the heart, the mind, and the will. They are transformers of energy. They are bodies, in other words. In the same way that we have a body here physically, we also have a body emotionally. Right now that body is lunar. It is a gift from nature. It doesn't belong to us. When we dream, we use that body. When we're flying around in our dreams and acting out all our desires and suffering in all our fears, 
We are in our lunar astral body. When we get out of our body through our exercises of dream yoga or astral projection or meditation, we are in our lunar astral body. It is lunar. It is not solar. In order to create that body, we have to follow a very specific science of transforming matter and energy, which is related with yasod, which is called tantra, which is called alchemy, it has many names. That science is extremely specific. It involves harnessing the energy of vitality. It involves harnessing the energy of the physical body, of the emotional body, of the mental body, of the causal body, of all these parts of ourselves. When I stated earlier that vital energy alone cannot unite us to God, it cannot. It is a part of the puzzle. But there are many people who practice exercises of transmutation, of tantra, of alchemy, of harnessing energy, even with the idea that they're going to create the astral body. But they are asleep. They are behaving in the same foolish ways they've always behaved, competing with each other, fighting with each other, gossiping, blaming, attacking, envious, jealous, not controlling their energy. So they harness their conditioned energies through their exercises of Tantra. In other words, in their anger, in their envy, in their jealousy to create the astral body, they harness those forces. What are they going to create? What will happen if you take your anger and try to make something from anger? What will happen if you take your lust and try to make something from lust? Can lust create beauty? Can anger create anything that has anything to do with God? Never. Never. The elevation of the spirit, the elevation of the soul... The creation of the solar man can only happen when we're working with pure energy, free energy, conscious energy. Energy that is not conditioned by pride, by anger, by fear, by jealousy, by gluttony, laziness, and all of those qualities that we have in abundance. This is a very difficult work. Many people come into this tradition and related traditions and think it's as easy as making pie. All you got to do is put the flour and the water and the salt and there it is. You'll have your soul. And many of them guarantee in two weeks you can have your astral body. Just give me a thousand dollars and I'll teach you how. There are many claims, many promises. They're all lies. God respects the law. God is the law. The law is, ego belongs where ego belongs. No ego can enter heaven. Anger is modified matter and energy that belongs in its level. Jealousy, envy, fear, gluttony, pride, laziness are matter and energy that trap consciousness that belong in their level. This is why all of us who have studied religion and spirituality say, why don't I have any experiences with God? Why won't God talk to me face to face? <laughs> Isn't the answer obvious? Who's talking? Your pride? Is that your pride demanding God to come down to you to talk to you? Do you think God will answer your pride? Or then we feel, I'm such a bad person. I'm so horrible. I've done all these bad things. Why won't God talk to me? Is that your shame? This is very difficult to establish a psychological equilibrium, to be cognizant and conscious of oneself, to be unconditioned. 
present, active, watchful, a master in your own house. And everybody enters spirituality and religion and wants to be a master. And there are many claiming to be masters. Yes, I am master so-and-so. And they have many beautiful titles. But then watch them curse when they stub their toe. Watch them spit their bitter, vile anger and vengefulness against those who don't agree with them. Watch them spit out their jealousy and envy of others. That is not mastery. All of these qualities are important. We need to learn about ourselves. Master our house. Clean it. Purge it. Anytime we find the slightest bit of dust, a shadow of pride, the scent of lust, we should not hesitate to see it, to watch it, to learn about it, to see how it works. How did it get in here? Who let it in? How did I create this? Everything that we have inside, everything that we experience, everything that we taste and touch and feel is a product of our own hands. Ours. And thus the true, sincere devotee of any religion never blames anyone else but himself. knowing very well the law of karma. Everything is transformations of energy. Everything begins in here. If we are receiving pain, it's because we created the causes for that. If we want to stop receiving pain, let us remove the causes. Those causes are inside, not outside. The causes of suffering are in our heart and mind, not outside. So in this psychological revolution... Cleaning out the lower parts of our mind, freeing consciousness, freeing our consciousness from its conditioning. The laws of nature naturally elevate us. It's a law of nature. It's inevitable. This is partly what that law of physics states. Remember, matter and energy cannot be destroyed. They can only change forms. Our consciousness never dies. It changes forms. Right now, our consciousness is trapped in suffering. Our consciousness is trapped in ignorance. We are trapped in all kinds of desires and beliefs and theories and politics and games and foolishness. Believing we are this and that when in fact we aren't. But the hope there is, by learning about those facts, by seeing ourselves for what we are, we can free ourselves from that. And once freed, that energy, that consciousness, can act in a good way and create good consequences and create good action. It's in our hands. Everything. Fundamentally, we have to start saving energy. We use many practices to aid us in this effort. The single most important is self-awareness. It's good to learn about transmutation. We need that. It's good to learn about meditation and how to eliminate the ego. We need that. It's good to learn runic practices, pranayama practices, Tibetan exercises, yogic exercises. There are thousands of exercises. Vocalizations, mantras. We need them. They're all important. But if we don't remember ourselves, if we are not cognizant of ourselves, all of those practices are completely useless and, in fact, can be dangerous. This is why our teacher, Samuel M. Vior, said there are many misguided 
people in the Gnostic movement who instead of becoming angels are becoming demons. Because they're not eliminating their ego. They're not remembering themselves. They're not awakening consciousness. They're just doing a lot of transmutation, a lot of practices, but continuing on being the same foolish people that they've always been. And the result is a big group of demons. The problem is they become worse than they were before because they have more energy devoted in the demonic way. They're harnessing more forces. It's a problem. This is why we're very explicit about it. Religion is not a feel-good, touchy-feely path covered with roses and flowers. It is not. Real religion is hard. It is not easy. It does not come from reading a book or believing something. It comes from a fight. And that fight is not against other people, against your family, against your friends, against other schools, other movements, other groups, other religions. It is against yourself. And you know what? None of us want to die as an ego. Yet death is the way. Jesus with his cross. John with his head on the platter. Osiris dead. Tammuz dead. Belen dead. Quetzalcoatl, dead. Odin, dead. All the great gods show in their stories, we must die. The ego, our pride, our self-love, our self-esteem, everything about us that we think is us has to die. This is a great postulate in Gnosis. In order to ascend to a new level of being, Everything about that old level of being has to cease. Look at yourself. You see what you are now? All of it has to go away. All of it. Only one thing stays. Your consciousness, your energy, but modified in a new way. And this is the difference. That law of physics states energy cannot be destroyed. It can only be modified. Consciousness is an energy, but a very high energy, very refined at its heights. And at its depths, it is very dark, very low. Nonetheless, it is a force, an energy that is modified. If we want to raise our level of consciousness, we have to strip away everything that belongs to that level of consciousness that we want to escape. We cannot keep anything. This is the mirror image of the myth of Ishtar. You see, that myth has many meanings. And there's another meaning, hidden. Our inner Ishtar has become garbed again. But in the underworld, we have dressed our Ishtar as a prostitute. Our inner Ishtar is Jezebel, a great harlot in the Bible, who has adorned herself with pride, with lust, with envy, with gluttony, with greed, with avarice. And in order for us to return to our source, but awakened, enlightened, purified, all of that has to be stripped away. And she has to return pure. And then be garbed with the solar garments. Do you have any questions? Okay. Yeah, Samuel and Vior also explains that Ishtar symbolizes Mary Magdalene or Venus, or Astarte, or Aphrodite, who is Gebra, the divine soul, Buddhi, but who is also the wife of any husband. Ishtar is an archetype, just like Venus and Isis are archetypes. They represent <clears throat> principles. And those principles apply in many levels. So 
today we were just addressing one aspect, or I guess two. Yeah, Ishtar has many meanings. Is there a question back here? Well, our indeed, it is will that moves us out of conditioning. But unfortunately, most of our will is also conditioned. So, for example, uh, it's very easy us for us to have a lot of willpower to chase our desires. When we really want money, or we really want alcohol, or we want drugs, or we want sex, or whatever, we can have a lot of willpower to get that. But when we want God, eh, just a little bit. Most of our will is trapped in desire. Will and consciousness are very closely related. They're qualities of soul. Consciousness related with buddhi, and will related with tiferet. Tiferet, you can also say, is consciousness, is human consciousness. They're very close. But these are the two parts of the monad, two parts of the soul. Two souls, in other words. Nonetheless, we have to free our will from desire. So when we find ourselves with a lot of will towards something, we need to analyze that. Why do I want this thing so much? Whatever it is, the job, the spouse, the person, the lifestyle, attention. A lot of us have a lot of will to get attention. We need to analyze that. Free that will so we can use it for other things. Is there another question somewhere here, I think? Yes? Very good questions. First is, do we all have the same amount of energies? No. The quality, the amount of energy that's available to us depends upon the strength of our monad, the level of being of our monad. Clear. That the quality, the amount of energy that a common person can move is very different from the amount of energy of a fallen bodhisattva. Both are fallen, but they have a very different impact. What that law states is that in that given system, the amount of energy remains the same. Right? This is a subtle thing. Because the law, the laws of thermodynamics apply what they call a universe, but that's just a given system. So each of us is a closed system in relation with our spirit, our ray. From the bottom of Klipoth to the Ainsoth, right? That's one system. And that has a given quantity of energy. But that quantity will change depending on the level of being of the monad. So a common monad will only have a given quantity. right? A monad that has reached realization, that has developed a bodhisattva, will have a different quantity of energy, more energy. right? But a dhyani bodhisattva will have even more. Now, that means that if you were to level all those human souls to the same level, they're all fallen, they would all have different quantities of energy that they could move, even being fallen. They would not be equal. Make sense? Can you repeat the second question for me? Uh, I stated that by us enhancing on the quality, quality of our energy, does that have an effect on the distribution of our Absolutely. Quality of energy and distribution are the, the whole key here. So we have a given amount of energy every day, right? We know that. 97% of our consciousness is trapped in ego, which means that most of our energy is unavailable to us. That given percentage, if we awaken consciousness from moment to moment, paying attention, we can modify and use that consciousness in the best possible way. That changes the quality. If we're asleep, it's totally mechanical. That energy is just mechanical energy. When we apply consciousness to it, that changes the quality, which also changes the effect. So if you have a conversation with somebody and you're just asleep, you could make a big mistake, right? You could enter into an agreement with somebody and something you didn't want, or you could imply something or say something you didn't mean to say. If you're very conscious of that conversation, you can say something 
in a very impactful, meaningful, useful way. So the quality has changed, right? It seems sort of logical. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Is there a question here too, I believe? The, the capacity to utilize demonic power? Is that the question? Yeah. We use the term demon in a very specific way here. Let me define that first. A demon is any person who is divorced from their innermost. <coughs> properly speaking. A demon is a psychological entity, like us, who has been divorced from the spirit. That is a fully-fledged demon. That type of person is a person that has no conscience. None. They can perform all manner of evils happily. And there are many people like that in the world. We would call them demons. Because they have no regret for committing grave crimes. Rape, murder, killing, stealing, pillaging, all of that. Properly defined, that's what a demon is. Nonetheless, because we're asleep, and because we are completely ignorant of our relationship with our innermost, we call ourselves demons. We still generally have a relationship with our innermost. So we're not fully-fledged demons in that sense, right? But we're on our way. So in that sense, we can say that all of the energy trapped in the ego is demonic. is energy that is not attached to God. All the energy of, that we have that's trapped in anger is demonic energy. It is divorced from God. God doesn't influence that. It's ego. We made that. God didn't make that. So that's demonic forces. We all have that. 97% of our consciousness is trapped in that. That's why our world is the way it is. Well, no. Yeah, good question. I'm glad you asked that. Matter is not evil or good. Matter is just matter. Likewise, energy is just energy. It isn't good or evil. Same with consciousness. It is not good or bad. It is just consciousness. Good, bad, evil, you know, these terms are relative. And they're very poorly misunderstood. Matter and energy and consciousness are vibrations that are modified by their level. They're not good or bad. What we call evil is something that's out of place, something harmful. What we call good is something that's in place, that is helpful. Simple as that. So you can take your virtue of like charity and think you're a very charitable person, but if you go and give your money to a drug addict, that's bad. We would call that evil, using a term in a bad way, right? So we have to understand first that. Secondly, consciousness, energy, and matter are modifications or are modified relative to their placement in nature. This is really important. It's subtle, but it's important. What that means is that how we use matter and energy creates a consequence, and that consequence is good or bad depending on the result. That's how we're measured by the law. We're not measured for intentions. We're not measured for what we intended to do, what we meant to do. We're measured for what we did. So good and evil, those terms are not used in the courts of like heavenly justice. What's used is, what is the result? Harmful or beneficial? Make sense? Is there a question here too? Yes. Do you have your hand up? Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Okay, the ego, very good question. The ego is a modification of matter, energy, and consciousness. Is a modification. Energy cannot be destroyed, meaning that the energy that is trapped in the matter of the ego needs to be liberated. The matter of the ego is condensed energy. This is subtle. It sounds like contradictory, right? But think about it this way. We have this... Um, 
graphic of our human machine. And there are always energies processing in our three brains. If that consciousness and energy that's processing in this matter is negative, polarized negative, meaning we have this uh, surge of lust in our three brains and we become hypnotized by it and we're putting our energy into that lust through our fantasy, imagination, or physical action, whatever the case may be, what's happening there is that energy is creating something in our own subconscious, infraconscious, or unconscious realms. We can say it's like a photograph. It's like an, uh, an impression, to use a Gnostic word. That impression is fed by those energies that are flowing through the three brains. And when that impression reaches a certain mass, it crystallizes. It becomes a form in hell, what we call an ego or an aggregate. It is a crystallization of those forces that were moving through the three brains. Consciousness, energy, matter. You see, those forces condense and, dense and become um, crystallized, more dense. They become a, a form of matter there, right? They use the matter of that environment to create a shape. And that shape is a reflection of what was happening in the mind at that time. This is why when you meditate and you go into those realms, you will see those shapes, those forms. They look like people. They look like us. That's why when we dream and we're in those realms, we don't know we're there. Because we're there interacting with all the forms in our mind, like we always are, not realizing what they are. They're egos that trap energy and consciousness. When we go into that realm consciously, when we meditate, when we analyze that ego, and we see that ego for what it is, we have to destroy it, the matter, the vessel, which that matter is crystallized at this level. It belongs here, but it's trapping other energies, right? Make sense? When we destroy it, the energy is liberated. The energy and the consciousness are liberated, and they return to their rightful places. It's a great victory, but we need to do that like tens of thousands of times. It's a lot to it. Yeah, they need to be reduced to nothingness, obliterated. And that's part of how nature functions anyway, right? Everything that is born dies. We have this huge collection of aggregates, which in the Bible is called the Legion. Remember the Legion? Where the man in chains who's living in the graveyard comes to Jesus, and Jesus says, who are you? And the guy says, I am Legion. And when Jesus helps him, all those demons go into the bodies of pigs. Remember that? and the pigs run into the sea, that's all a symbol of klipop. The pigs represent lust, desire. We have to kill those pigs that are in us to obliterate them in order to free the chained spirit, which is ourselves. There's a question somewhere here, I think. Matt. Um, coming back to the first law thermodynamics that we've been talking about, you said that the, the individual it's, itself is a system, and that the, the law must apply within that system, but right. that system exists within a larger system within which the law must also apply. That's right. Is uh, this therefore the basis behind the doctrine of, I think it's the twin souls, or as one moves along the path of self-realization, there must also be a... That's a great mystery, very difficult <laughs> to comprehend. <laughs> That would yeah. also mean that, that someone's energy is increasing as well as someone's energy, someone else's energy is decreasing. Which relates with entropy and the second law, the second. which gets very complicated. <laughs> I was going to talk about that today, but it just gets so hard to grasp. Yeah, it's related to that. Because I, I couldn't grasp it when I was trying to pick it up. It's related. It, it comes back, it comes, that question comes to the second law of thermodynamics, which is entropy, which is a measurement of energy. And that law is uh, subservient to the first law, which is the law of invariance. In, in balance, what these two laws basically state is energies always seek to equilibrate. They always will, across all of nature, seek to be harmonized, to be equilibrated, to be equaled. That's entropy. Some people now, for a couple, like about 100 years, People have thought entropy meant order and disorder. It doesn't mean that. 
it implies it in certain cases, but the true meaning of entropy is, is a measurement of energy and how energy moves from one state to another state. So it's very complicated in this context. So I'm not going to go there today. <laughs> There's another question somewhere here, I think. Okay, in the back. What practical techniques can keep us focused on our inner being? Really, it comes down to will. The will to do it. The will to remember. They say in Buddhism that in order to be properly prepared, you need an extended period of study. And that period of study is a time in which you're training yourself to remember to do the work. And so that's why we encourage students to read the books of Samael and Vior, to study the lectures, to study the scriptures, to study the Bible, and to do some practice every day. Some meditation, some mantras, something, whatever it is that you find useful and actually benefit from. Not just something you do repeated because you feel like you have to. You have to find things that really help you because then you'll continue and you'll keep doing it and you'll grow it. Little by little, that combination puts an influence on your consciousness so that you start to realize the truths that all these religions have been expressing and the practical truths that you can find in your own efforts. And that's how you start to develop the real method to remember God continually. It only comes gradually by continued effort. That's just willpower. It's not easy. All of us go through periods where we forget. All of us. I've had students come and go, you know, I was in the lecture and I was hearing all this about self-remembering. I was so enthusiastic. But as soon as I walked out the door and then I didn't remember until I got here again two weeks later. And I said, well, at least you remembered when you got here. <laughs> right? At least we remember. As many times as we fail, if we keep remembering, we're doing it. The thing is to keep remembering. Keep trying. Don't look back. Be here. Was there another in the back? Hmm. It's a trick question. Is there an energy that is beyond a fully awakened being? Beyond or more refined. Okay. Interesting. Is there an energy beyond or more refined than a fully awakened being? Yes. That is because there are universes within universes. There are levels within levels. We study the tree of life here, which shows us our microcosm of ourselves, all the way from the lowest levels, all the way up into the absolute, which is the abstract space, that which is without attributes. It is the uncreated light. It is a level of non-existence, or light that has not become light yet. We talk about these levels in ourselves and outside of ourselves, and there are many beings inhabiting all these levels outside of ourselves, because these levels represent the hells below, the heavens above. And throughout these heavens, there are many beings of many levels, an, inf an infinite number. If you see the stars in the sky, those are those beings. And yet, even when someone reaches the pinnacle of spiritual development in this universe, that pinnacle is a doorway into another universe, another level that is so far beyond our conception that even Samael and Vior couldn't get, understand it. It's a level that is far, far beyond. He wrote about this in Cosmic Teachings of a Lama and also uh, Logos Mantra Theurgy about uh, beings that were entering into the absolute to go into the beyond, into another level of evolution. So this is something you don't have to worry about finishing. <laughs> okay? Don't worry about finishing. Worry about getting started. Yes. Hmm. What can we do to increase our mental memory in order to become more awake? Good question. Well, being awake has nothing to do with mental energy. 
nothing. Being awake is conscious. It is a conscious energy. It is related with the energy of our consciousness. And that can only awaken itself. Tricky. What I was explaining earlier, this is a good question because it reveals something about what I was explaining earlier. Everybody that's in different religions and spiritual groups, including the Gnostic movement, thinks in their own way that if they work with energy of will, mental energy, emotional energy, vitality, or mechanical energy, one of those or a combination of those, that they will awaken consciousness. False. They cannot. Those all help. They are all part of it. But they do not awaken consciousness. Consciousness awakens itself. If you're not awake, you can do all the practices of will you want. You can do all the meditating you want, all the practices related to your emotion, all the practices of vitality. It will not awaken you because you're asleep. Stated simply, if you work with meditation, if you work with mantras, do it consciously. Then you're doing it right. If you're doing it mechanically, distracted, you're singing your mantra, Om Mani Padme, Om Mani Padme, chanting your mantra, but you're thinking about that car that you saw, that red car that was so cool. You're wasting your time. If you're doing your practice of tantra, of transmutation, using energies of vitality, but you're thinking about work, or you're thinking about that pain in your leg, you're wasting your time. If you're doing your runic practices and you're singing your mantras, but you're thinking about how much you want to be finished so you can go eat, you're wasting your time. Whatever you do, do that fully, awake, cognizant, aware, watchful. Don't think of something else. Be there and do that, nothing else. That is how you practice Gnosis. So when you meditate, when you're working on an ego and you're trying to comprehend something in yourself, in your mind, only do that. And if you're distracted, analyze why you're distracted. And if you're singing a mantra, only sing the mantra. Don't think about football or about American Idol or whatever it is that interests you. Do that only. And believe me, this is not easy. Especially in the beginning, it's really hard. But I'll give you a great insight into this. The more persistently that you make the effort to be aware of yourself from moment to moment, all day long, every day, the easier it gets. It's very hard in the beginning. It's exhausting. It can take days, weeks, months, even years until it becomes something that's natural to you. But if you persist, it will become natural. And then that effort becomes effortless. Samuel M. Vior told us that eventually he reached the level where self-remembering was normal for him. But it took a long time. And then he didn't have to make effort. He just remembered himself. In the beginning, we have to make a lot of effort, continually, constantly, moment to moment. Don't forget that. Keep trying. Last question. That's a big question. <laughs> That's a whole course. Yeah, obviously, the energy of Christ, or as the Babylonians would say, Tammuz, is related with the seven gates. It's related with initiation. It's related with the creation of the soul. It's related with the perfection of the soul. And these are two sets of seven, the serpents of fire and the serpents of light. Serpents of fire are where you create the soul. Serpents of light, you perfect the soul. And obviously, all of that is related with the coming of Christ into our soul, into our hearts. Again, Christ is just a force. It's an energy. Now, what happens here, worth mentioning, 
we talked about how energy is at a specified amount in a given system. When we create the soul, that system changes. The capacity of that system to manage energy changes. Likewise, when that soul resurrects, that capacity changes. And the capacity difference is similar, or it could be compared to the energy of a match, to the energy of a sun. That's the difference. So when I say, or when the law of physics states, and I remind us that the energy in a given system is a fixed quantity, it doesn't mean that that system itself is a fixed quantity. Right? It means the energy in that system is fixed. But we all know that a capacitor is designed to handle a certain amount of energy. But if you get a bigger capacitor, you can handle more. Right? Simple. That's what happens in our soul, in our consciousness. When Christ comes, the capacity to manage light changes, to manage energy. And there are levels and levels. Okay, thank you. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.